Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Tokushikai Inside Look podcast, where I share inspiring stories of Budoka around the world. Please share your favorite episodes with your dojo and community so this effort can be spread to more corners of the earth. This episode is brought to you by our amazing patrons over at Patreon. By donating as little as a cup of coffee to a bowl of ramen, they've directly made this podcast possible. If you're enjoying this work and can spare a small tip each month, it would mean a lot to me. You can find it at www.patreon.com forward slash Tokushikai Canada. Thanks in advance for your support. And now, on to the interview. Okay, so、um, in Budo, there are two aspects of training that all practitioners will eventually confront in their Budo journey. One is learning, and the other is teaching. First, when one starts Budo, one is in a learning mode, trying to acquire as much information as possible. Trying to develop as much skill as possible. We are in a student mindset and our job is to learn and absorb. Then, inevitably, as one gets older and more experienced in the art, one will have to teach it to others, to the new students who will walk in the door. On the topic of teaching, there are、um, a myriad number of issues on how to teach, but one、uh, visual chart、uh, caught my eye and、uh, my interest, and that was the question of. How should educators see themselves?、Um, and in this chart,、uh, as you see on the screen, the authors break it down into eight viewpoints. So teachers should see themselves as number one, adventurers, number two, scientists, storytellers, teachers, researchers, parents, pioneers, and innovators. This very question goes to the heart of. Why do we teach? Which drives it, what drives us to teach, and what should we aspire to do in this job of teaching? Teaching can become very humdrum in a tedious routine. We have probably all saw teachers who show up to class and just blandly cover the material. Okay, this is what we are doing today. There is no passion, no engagement, no wonder. It is obvious that they view teaching as a job and go through the motions. Teaching to them is a chore. Really, they don't. Especially enjoy teaching.、Uh, other teachers are there for the power and the glory. Especially in Budo, teaching is a sign and symbol of high rank and achievement in the art. In some cases, you are expected to teach once you reach a certain high rank. For some people, this is when the ego begins to get big, like a balloon. They are now the center of the universe, or at least their dojo.、Uh, these are the symbols of their status in their art. They may not like teaching, but they like the status and power that comes with the position of teacher or master.、Um, being a good martial artist, being good at martial arts, doesn't mean that you are good at teaching it, because teaching it is not about you doing it, but instead about getting the student to learn it and do it. So it's not about you anymore; it's about them. So what separates the mediocre, humdrum teacher from the really excellent teachers? In thinking about this subject, I went back over my interviews with my master, and this one, this one part, kept coming back into my mind. So I will just read it to you, if you will bear with me for a minute. I asked him,、um, as a teacher, what do you try to teach your students apart from just technique? And Sensei said, I try to teach my students three rules to live their life by. Number one, love what you do. This is the most important. Number two, do it from the heart. We say kokoro. In other words, do it with all your heart and soul. Number three, continue it. Keep doing it. Don't stop. These are the three main rules. Now, after these three, I also recommend to my students two more. Number four, don't be afraid. And number five, take things on. By this, I mean try new things. So these are the five things he mentioned that is really important. And as we shall see in our discussion, these five points keep coming up over and over again. So let's take a look at this chart and work our way through it, section by section, to try to see how it can inform us about our basic question: What makes a good teacher in Budo? So the first section is the adventurer. It says educators must have the restless heart of an adventurer to try new things and step outside their comfort zone. So, an adventurer—that's an interesting idea. 
Uh, in our style, um, Yagyu Shinkagedu, our second headmaster, Yagyu Sekishusai, had a famous saying. He said that you should surpass the self that you were yesterday. What does he mean by that? Well, um, Yagyu Nobuharu Sensei, the 21st Soke, gave an explanation in a speech in 1993 in New York City during his demonstration of the art at the United Nations. He said, a continuous improvement of the self is the way of Yagyu Shinkage Du. In many cases, we get satisfied when we reach a certain level. We must not be satisfied to reach one level of skill or only one target. For example, if you climb a mountain, once you reach the top, you see another larger mountain. You must now go to that taller mountain. If you feel happy with your present standing, then actually you are already losing your skill level. Instead, you must keep trying to improve and eventually you will find something to push yourself forward from within. Continuously trying to improve at the sword is related to the same effort made in Zen training. Training in the sword in Yagyu Shinkage-ryu means a constant improvement of the self through training in how to use the sword. So this is the spirit of striving and reaching for greater heights. This is the spirit of exploration. In fact, if you recall my interview with Kajitsuka Sensei, he said his rule number five was to try new things. Now the definition above also mentioned that the heart of an adventurer also means to step outside our comfort zone. That is important too. I interviewed Kajitsuka Sensei in 2011. For those who are not aware, um, he is the Secretary General of the Nihon Kobudo Shinkokai, the Society for the Promotion of Japanese Classical Martial Arts and Ways, which is the oldest national association of the classical styles of Japanese Budo and Bujutsu, what they call Koryu in Japan. I interviewed him about the dangers inherent in associations. One particular quote was very poignant. He said, in the case of Kobudo, each duha, which means style or school, has been protecting its own unique tradition and interest for several hundred years. Therefore, it is not unreasonable that they are very self-respecting. In other words, they are proud of what they do and who they are. It is natural to feel this way. However, the danger is that it is easy to become exclusive. By this, I mean that there is the possibility they did that they do not recognize other duha. There is also the danger that they will slander each other. If this happens, the association will not be unified. That is the comfort zone and it is natural for some people and organizations to not want to leave that comfort zone, their own little bubble. Like the proverbial ostrich that just wants to stick its head in the ground and not acknowledge that there's a larger world out there. So what is the solution for an association to succeed and to grow? He remarked, first of all, it is important to deepen the exchange between schools. Each duha is founded under the influence of other duha. What I mean is that each style does not come into being in a vacuum. They are influenced by, and also in their turn, influence other duha. They are all interconnected with each other in many ways. You can understand your own school in a deep way by studying not only your own school, but also other schools as well. But this is only possible through the interchange and exchange between the various duha. In addition, through this, the interchange between the duha, I hope that all Kobudo practitioners will come to see that all martial arts have a common root. And in the end, they all have the same purpose. If we can achieve this kind of understanding, we can become more unified and united, and ultimately we will be able to achieve greater things. That's, that's interesting. This is getting outside your comfort zone, leaving your tiny little bubble and experiencing the world as a teacher, you can't just stick your head in the ground. You can't just do the easy, comfortable things over and over again. That gets very boring. 
And over time, as a teacher, you will get too comfortable to the point that you cannot change. I've seen it happen in regular teaching. Teachers get so set in their routine that they refuse to change. They are teaching from the same book in the same way 20 years later. They are stuck and have limited themselves. Pretty soon they know nothing else. They haven't kept up with the trends and soon they are out of touch with what is happening in the outside world. That is when they become afraid to change. There's too much ground to cover. They would have to become a beginner again. And that they cannot stoop down that low to start again. So how do we avoid this kind of situation? It starts by not being afraid to try new things and being adventurous. When you embrace change, you will not fall behind. So as a teacher, trying new things is actually a good idea. This is the heart of the teacher as adventurer, the love of trying new things and experiences. Uh, the second section is the scientist. It says, educators must have the mind of a scientist to push beyond what we can see with our eyes and imagine theories, articulate these and find evidence to dispute or confirm them. Okay, um, in this way, I think it means you have to be dedicated. This is Kajitska Sensei's rule number two, do it with all your heart. Dedicated to finding out the truth of your art, knowing everything about it. In this way, teachers should aspire to be a subject matter expert. That means being knowledgeable in that art, knowing all about that art. It is also about being skilled. It's about ability as well. You can be very knowledgeable like an encyclopedia, but you also have to be able to do it well. In this way, um, yeah, sorry. Now the key to becoming a subject matter expert requires either having or if not, then developing some essential character traits inside you. Things like being analytical, being able to analyze your art. Another one is being open-minded in order to see the possibilities and even conflicting information. This also entails sometimes being dispassionate in your analysis of your art and not just adhering to established dogma. Expertise requires experience and study. Therefore, you should be disciplined and dedicated to practicing your art. This is Kajitsa Sensei's rule number three, keep doing it. Part of the mind of a scientist is their methodology. They keep pushing the limits, testing and finding out the limits. That requires repetitions. In Budo, that requires repetitions of practice. The same is true in sports and athletics. They need to train endlessly to hone and perfect their craft. Same as we do in Budo. So what does this have to do with teaching? Good teachers are usually in most cases, great learners as well. They know how to learn. They have learned how to dissect and break down kata into discrete movements and then break down these movements into specific skills, into the fundamentals. Maybe I should say back into the fundamentals. Once that is done, they can make it comprehensible for their own students to learn them. Having the mind of a scientist also entails following a scientific method and having a methodology for learning, deciding, and deciding on and setting out a blueprint for learning that helps the student to master the material. That is also the job of a teacher, to provide that roadmap to mastery. That takes some planning and thought and some imagination. But you must enjoy constructing learning opportunities for your students. This is the mind of the teacher as scientist. The love of designing learning. Hmm. Uh, the third section is the storyteller. It says, educators must have the imagination of a storyteller to paint vivid colors, different types of stories, and to share these stories with the world. I teach grade one. Part of my job is not just to teach one plus one. Simple math, science, and language arts like how to form a sentence are important, yes. Just like a teacher of Iido, for instance, your job is to teach them how to cut. But is it only that? The world would be a pretty dry place if that was all we taught. I believe that it is also important as a teacher who has the responsibility to socialize the next generation to share the richness of our values 
our norms and our ways of thinking and acting that make us who we are as a culture. To do this, a teacher needs to be a role model and also a good storyteller to tell the stories of our culture. In this way, teachers need to share the joy, leave a life-changing impact, inspire, and model. In Budo styles with rich histories, these stories are part of the culture, the mythos of that specific art and that specific style. Styles are cultures. They have, they have their own way of thinking and acting. Mannerisms like Kajitsuka Sensei said. The Japanese government has named or designated some styles as national treasures because they are, in their definition, intangible cultural artifacts. Notice the words that they use, cultural artifacts. They are exemplars of a culture, in this case, a Budo culture. It then begs the question, what is culture? Culture is defined as the cumulative deposit of knowledge, experience, beliefs, values, attitudes, religion, and ways of seeing the world and acting in it. As an aside, I, I want to mention a part of the interview I conducted with Kajitsuka Sensei in 2015. I asked him about the purpose of the association. He answered, As regards our Kobudo Association, I believe we have an important purpose. Kobudo is not purely about fighting and combat only. Yes, the arts that our members practice are combat arts, and so naturally there is a focus on combat, on fighting. But Kobudo also includes the wisdom of how to live. How to live as a person, as a human being. If we think in terms of a single style, this is ultimately what the founder of that specific style learned under the risk of his life on a battlefield. Therefore, I think that Kobudo is a precious property of not only Japan, but also of all human beings, no matter what nationality they are. Wow. So a style basically is the sum product of the experiences of, of a founder, the lessons he learned on the battlefield. That, that's what the sensei said. Of course, he learned, the, the founder, he learned which techniques are most effective at killing opponents. Yes. But this founder also learned, quote unquote, the wisdom of how to live, how to basically how to stay alive and keep staying alive. So let's think about that for a while and use a style to illustrate what that might mean. Recall that the definition of culture is the cumulative deposit of knowledge, experience, beliefs, values, attitudes, religion, and ways of seeing the world and acting in it. So a style is that deposit of knowledge by the founder, what he learned at the risk of his life. He survived that harrowing experience and lived to tell the tale to others, to advise and warn his descendants and followers. And he continued to live, and that wisdom and knowledge kept him alive throughout his lifetime. These are the beliefs, values, and attitudes. Um, for example, in Muso Shinden Ishindu Yaido, which I studied in Japan, um, there's a kata at higher levels where you cut three opponents who are hiding in the bushes along a pathway. That is an experience the founder actually experienced and had to deal with. That is a valuable life lesson on what to expect along pathways. And more importantly, how to deal with this scenario. It is both advice and warning. It is a way of seeing the world and acting in it. In our art of Yagyu Shin Kagedu, there's a kata that deals specifically with fighting two opponents. How do you fight two opponents who are rushing at you at the same time? This is the wisdom of how to stay alive. So a style is a culture. And you can also view the curriculum of techniques and katas as basically a set of stories from that culture. A culture born in blood, but perhaps not ending in it. These stories shed insight, and in some styles, some cultures, can illuminate your life. I will give an example from Yagyu Shinkakadu, which is very famous in Japan for its core philosophy of the life-giving sword, the sword of peace. 
And one of the famous stories involved Kami Izumi Ise no Kami, Nobutsuna, the founder. In this episode, during his journey to Kyoto with his two disciples, they came to a village near Miyoko Temple, where they found a bandit, uh, where they found that a bandit had captured a child and was trapped in a hut, threatening to kill the child with his sword if anyone came in. Well, suffice it to say that Nobutsuna went in unarmed at great risk to his life and rescued the child. It is so famous that director Akira Kurosawa used it as the opening scene in his classic movie, Seven Samurai. He used it to illustrate the bravery of, of his main character, Kambe, which he modeled on Kami Izumi. Anyway, this episode is a perfect example of mutodori, the concept of no sword, one of the highest principles of Yagyu Shinkage Ryu, being able to fight someone with anything, even empty handed if necessary, and not being afraid to do so, being mentally and spiritually ready to do exactly that. That is the culture of Yagyu Shinkage Ryu, that is its belief system being free of fear, being brave in the face of danger. That is what the founder learned at great risk to his life and the tremendous life lesson that it is teaching us. It is a way of seeing life, approaching life and how to live it well and fully. Uh, being a storyteller, I just gave you a perfect example of that. Being a good teacher is also being a good storyteller because it is our responsibility to pass these stories on to the next generation. These stories enrich the art. Some practitioners approach an art just looking at its techniques. They are only interested in its techniques, but that is kind of empty. Just cut, cut, and cut. I think of this as the bones. Um, here's a story from my days in Japan. I attended a special three-day symposium on Budo culture at the Budo University in Chiba in 1991, I believe. Anyway, you, you meet a, a lot of high level practitioners of many martial arts there. And one guy I remember was a fifth or sixth Dan Iaido uh, practitioner from Iran. I think he was a teacher in Iran. Super nice guy. He couldn't speak any English at all. The only English word he knew was cut. And he was trying to teach us about some high level Iaido katas. And I vividly remember him saying over and over, you cut and you cut and you cut. It was kind of funny, but I guess essentially correct. You cut and you cut and you cut. I suppose you could approach Yaido that way from that kind of utilitarian approach, but it is empty. I believe he wanted to tell us more. Obviously he couldn't because he didn't have the language ability, but it struck me at that moment that yes, styles can be viewed in that way, as just a collection of techniques, a collection of bones. But you need some meat on those bones to give it life. Storytelling adds that meat to enliven those empty, soulless bones. This adds the vivid color, the vibrancy to the techniques that makes them come alive. Storytelling encourages us to dream, to imagine. What is the meaning of the technique? Why did the founder choose this one and not that one? What is he trying to tell us? So the job of a teacher is also to provide the stories that allow the students to imagine and to feel, or some say to taste the wonder of the art. My first sword teacher, Sugino Sensei, said that it is important to feel the fascination in Japanese, myomi, and to understand the mystic depth in Japanese, myori, which is hidden, deeply hidden in the technique. Myomi can also be translated as fine taste or, and myori as exquisite logic, even mystery. So feel the fine taste or understand the exquisite logic or the mystery hidden deeply in the technique. So Sugino Sensei is saying that in the techniques are hidden these mysteries and messages that the founder is trying to tell us. It is our job as teacher to unpackage them and help the students to get a taste of them. So this is the imagination of the teacher as storyteller, the love of telling stories. The fourth section is the teacher. It says, educators must have the soul of a teacher 
to instill the love of learning, inquiry, and to explain our world to others. This brings to my mind a story. Years ago, I was walking through the halls of, of a high school where my youngest son took Japanese lessons on the weekends. And I noticed this award plaque on the wall. It had the engraved photo of the person it memorialized and the following words describing the award. The Margaret Thompson Memorial Award. Margaret will always be remembered as a caring and dedicated teacher who had the ability to bring out the best in her students, her genuine concern and empathy for students facing a myriad of problems was evident in her daily contacts with them and resulted in helping many to develop their self-esteem. She gave of, her, of herself to everyone. Students who too often arrive feeling unworthy and unloved left knowing that they had a caring friend and ally in Margaret. She helped her students through many difficult times, juggling crises and easing the way with a gentle humor and a sense of calm. Margaret would always be remembered with much love. This award will be given to a graduating student who displays an open, caring personality, a sense of humor, leadership qualities, and a love of life. When people were rushing to and fro through the halls in a frenzy to pick up their children, I was standing there quite deep in thought, looking at this plaque and thinking about what it meant. Hmm. Margaret will always be remembered as a caring and dedicated teacher. So she cared for her students. She was dedicated to her job. Maybe teaching is not just a job like any other office job, nine to five, punch in, punch out and go home, free to forget about it. No, teachers think about their students 24 seven. Reflecting, analyzing, mulling it over and over. It is a calling like religion. Driven by ideals, you have to be dedicated to keep at, to keep at it year after year, caring for generation after generation of students who come through your door. Her genuine concern and empathy for students. So another set of traits generally considered essential to have as a teacher. If you don't care about your students, get out of teaching. If you cannot sympathize with your students' various plights, find a new profession. You will not be a good teacher unless you are genuine, genuinely concerned. A lot of people can fake it or go through the motions of pretending that they care, but really don't. But if you are doing this, you are just lying to yourself. Resulted in helping many to develop their self-esteem. This is really the crux of the matter. In many cases, it is, about, it is all about self-esteem. In sword arts and other martial arts, it is about self-confidence. Confidence in one's ability and feeling good about what they are doing and how well they are doing it. The teacher's job is not to belittle the student or to be one step ahead of the student or to keep them down, like keep them humble and submissive or other such nonsense. If you're thinking this way, you have your own issues that need to be tended to first. She gave of herself to everyone. So this is that piece about selflessness, self-sacrifice again. Teaching is a tough job because you have to give of yourself. Students who too often arrive feeling unworthy and unloved left knowing that they had a caring friend and ally in Margaret. Well, this is true in many cases. Students come looking for answers. If they had the answers, they wouldn't come. And the answers that the students are seeking in martial arts are usually not of the how can I beat this guy to a bloody pulp variety? They might be looking for ways to better themselves, be more at ease, more confident, feel better physically, feel better mentally, feel better spiritually, look better, meet new people, be part of a new group, etc. cetera. Um, basically enriching their lives in some fashion. So in some ways, a teacher is also a psychiatrist and self-esteem coach. She helped her students through many difficult times, juggling crises and easing the way with a gentle humor and a sense of calm. The key words here are gentle humor and calm. Humor is essential. Too serious is no good. Too loose, however, is also not good. Some dojos are so serious and uptight that you can hear a pin drop on the floor. And the students live in mortal fear of doing something wrong. I've, I've been in those dojos. Other dojos are so loose, 
it seems like it is some kind of party or um, like a wild daycare. So ease the tension with a calm and purposeful atmosphere. That is probably the best. She helped her students through many difficult times, juggling crises. So a teacher wears many hats, educator, social worker, confidant, manager, psychologist, organizer, psychiatrist, counselor, nurse, therapist, spiritual advisor, and many others. So it's all about good classroom management and good people management. You are the calm in the storm. Margaret will always be remembered with much love. Well, there it is. The ultimate statement of praise for a good teacher and a job well done. So this reminds me of Kajitsa Sensei's rule number two. Do it with all your heart. It is difficult to teach if your heart is not in it. Love, enthusiasm, passion. These all come from the heart. There's also rule number one. Love what you do. Love of the art. Love of learning. Love of teaching. Love of practicing and training. And love of students. Yes, teachers must cover subject matter material. That's the easy part. And maybe 10% of our day. Inspire and guide. Now that is more difficult. On one of my textbooks on what makes a good teacher, there's this photo that I remember to this day. It was a photo of a teacher with a sweatshirt on it, on which was emblazoned the words, I don't teach, I inspire. How very true. If we do not inspire them to do it, the students will not do it themselves. It is our job to light that fire. And it all comes from the heart. This is the soul of the teacher as teacher, the love for the students. The fifth section is the researcher. It says educators must have the curiosity of a researcher to continuously search, test, try, prototype, and document the work to contribute to a larger purpose of advancing education. This brings to mind an episode I had with my thesis advisor who was a well-respected professor in her field. She was widely published and very knowledgeable. One day I was in her office and we were talking about how does one know? Surprisingly, she admitted to me that she is not smarter than anyone else. I objected and said, but you have a PhD. That means you know a lot, that you're an expert. To which she replied to me, having a PhD doesn't mean that I am smarter than others. It just means that I ask better questions. I'm really good at asking the right questions. Frankly, I was astounded by this revelation. One, that she was not so smart by her own admission, but more importantly, that being an expert doesn't mean that you possess some magical ability to store knowledge or have some kind of astounding IQ, but instead that you get better and better at asking the right questions. Hmm. Long story short, she told me that the key is to keep researching. The road to knowledge is not magic, but hard work. Continuing to search for answers, it, is com it completely changed my perception of professors. They are the seekers, asking better questions to advance knowledge. When you ask a good question, you will get a good answer, which will bring up more questions which then lead to more and perhaps different types of questions. That is the quest for knowledge. Pushing the boundaries of accepted knowledge, or some might call it dogma. In this way, they are lifelong learners, never satisfied with their current state of knowledge, but forever questioning. That, she said, was how we expand our knowledge. That is progress. I've heard many um, Yado practitioners and teachers complaining about the new fashions from Paris, whenever new changes come from Japan, right? But in a way, this is the same process of questioning and experimenting that is necessary to keep updating and advancing the knowledge base. Otherwise, it becomes a stale, dead art if it remains unchanged. Basically, it will become a museum piece, immutable, forever under glass. 
When I interviewed Kajusa Sensei in 2008, I asked him about teachers and students. He said, there is no teacher and there is no student. I was totally perplexed. I asked, I said, what do you mean there are no teachers and no students? To which he replied, here is an analogy. Budo is like climbing a mountain. Everyone is climbing up the same mountain. I'm just farther up the mountain than you. I have seen the path that you will take. So I can point out some of the pitfalls that I have already encountered on my journey up this mountain. However, you must realize that I am still myself going up this mountain. But I am not a guide telling you where you should go. We are all mountain climbers in the same group. But there are naturally some of us with more experience than the rest of the group. Um, what he said, we are all mountain climbers climbing up the Budo mountain. He is talking about researching Budo principles. He himself is still climbing that mountain, still researching, still exploring. He hasn't found his answers yet. And that was very inspirational to me. So from these two inspirational teachers of mine, the professor and, and Kujitsuka Sensei, I have learned that research is also an integral part of our job as teachers. This is the curiosity of the researcher, the love of researching and advancing our knowledge base. The sixth section is the parent. Educators must have the unselfishness of a parent to unconditionally love our profession and share without expecting anything in return. This idea of unselfishness is very telling. We always ask new teachers, why do you teach? That is a good question. If they say they do it for the money, then they will not last long. There is no money in teaching, especially in teaching Buddha. I think it boils down to, you have to love the art. And when you love the art, you want to share it with others, to share the joy with others, to have others join you in enjoying this art. In a sense, it's about love. Budo, in some ways, is a lonely road. It is built into the basis of the art, in a way. This is because, as an art, it is a means of survival, fighting against an enemy. It's a very personal thing when you fight one-on-one -on -one with an enemy face-to-face. -face. Everyone and anyone can be an enemy. In, in this way, it is lonely. It is not cooperative. Your trials and tribulations in your journey in Budo are very personal. Yes, Budo is a journey of discovery and we need companions on this road to discovery. Discovery about the art and also discovery of yourself. When I came back to Canada, I had nobody. I knew nobody. I couldn't train indefinitely by myself. I needed training partners. So you need to create and develop and grow your own training partners. This is how it usually begins. This is how I built this group from nothing. We came from very humble beginnings. Do I expect anything in return? No. It was done for my own selfish purpose, I guess, to have someone to train with. And yet, I realize I will not live forever. My responsibility to the art that I have learned and what my teachers have taught me must not die. I guess that is my debt to my teachers, um, a debt of honor. They trusted me, had faith in me, believed in me. And for me not to honor that, to let it die, would be selfish. In the same way I entrust it to the future, there are some great lessons in what I have learned, things that people will spend hundreds of dollars in trying to read about in a self-help book or a video. And to top it off, I teach it for free, even. Imagine that. Uh, my first master, Yoshio Sugino, said, Traditionally, the teaching of Budo was from teacher to student, heart to heart, without words. Heart to heart, without words. That is also a form of love. The teacher loves his or her student, much like a parent loves a child. We can never repay our teachers, especially if they pass away. But we can pay it forward by teaching our own students well and passing on the legacy. In 2015, one of my students from Mexico named Hector interviewed Kajitska Sensei about Yagyu Shingandu, a comprehensive battlefield style which includes study in many weapons, but is famous for its impressive jujitsu techniques. 
By the way, Kajiska Sensei is the 11th lineal headmaster, the Soke, of this style, which was founded at the beginning of the Edo period. Hector wrote about it afterwards. It is such a great story that I will recite it to you now. It went like this. He said, I asked Kajiska Sensei, what are the most important things that Yagyu Shingandu practitioners should take into account? He replied, number one, love humans. Number two, train nonstop to develop physical strength and inner strength. Number three, always be gentle, never engage in violence. Number four, never fight with anyone but yourself. Number five, have a great hope in humanity. Upon receiving this response and after hearing his explanations on each of these points, I realized that this seminar, these techniques and martial arts in general are empty unless the practitioner truly wants to become a better human being. This is Hector speaking. He went on to explain that schools have changed. The purpose has changed from killing to preserving life, especially in Yagyu Shinkage Ryu. We must train nonstop. Through the practice of kata, only then can we hope to wrap ourselves in and come to understand the spirit, mind, and hopes of the founder. He said that Buddha was born a long time ago. That it is not only for Japanese people, it's for everyone in the world, and it is meant for peace and hope. By embracing the spirit of the founder and practicing the principles of Zen through the practice of kata, we can eventually become experts in being good human beings in the world. Wow. So I think from this interview, we can see how much he loves his art and how much he loves people. To want to help people, that requires unselfishness. Uh, like what was written above about feeling like a parent who cares for his or her children. We again see love. In 2016, Kajisa Sensei came to Toronto uh, once again and gave a seminar in Shingandu. He expanded upon this idea of the dichotomy between taking life and preserving life. A key idea came up in the post-seminar discussion about the origins of the art, what its original purpose was. Sensei remarked that Yagyu Shingandu is really a very complete art with two sides. What the students now focus on is only one side of the art, that of the destructive side of the art. Students focus on how to harm or hurt an aggressor. In this way, what they study now is incomplete. There is a constructive, more beneficial side of the art, which has been partially lost. That side embraces healing. As Sensei explained, the art can be used to hurt, to destroy, but it, can, but it also teaches how to heal a person. As an example, he talked about pressure points. Um, he had demonstrated in the katas um, that the group reviewed earlier in the day, the knowledge of pressure points plays an important role in submissions and takedowns. This is jujitsu he's talking about. However, he also remarked that this same knowledge of pressure points was and can also be used to heal as evidenced by its use in acupuncture and such healing arts as shiatsu. Sensei encouraged the Shingandu practitioners to not just view the art as a destructive one, but to look into its more beneficial side as well. So, very interesting. Being empathetic, caring is also a part of Budo. People don't realize this. This is another form of love. Sugino Sensei once said, Budo training begins with courtesy and it ends with courtesy. Courtesy, respect, are very important values in Budo. It is the backbone of the spirit of Bushido, the code of the warrior, of the samurai. And um, the Japanese word is de, deishiki, how to, how to bow, etiquette, okay. Or deho is another word they use. Okay, and he went on to say, um, this is Sugino Sensei speaking, courtesy is worshiping the gods, respecting people, Revealing your heart, because according to this, various virtues will grow in you. From the beginning, the roots of the Japanese spirit can be said to be worshipping the gods, 
having belief, and respectful worship from a thankful heart. Now remember, uh, the style that he taught was Katori Shintoryu, which is heavily, um, it's very religious style, and it's based on Shintoism and Buddhism. And Shintoism is the native religion of Japan, which goes back to its, I guess, the beginning of Japan. So it's a very kind of um, old uh, religion for them. Okay, this belief, worship, faith, thankfulness, and revealing your heart are all forms of love. And it is unselfishness, not thinking of yourself, but of others and of the gods, because in the old days they believed in the gods. Okay, in Yagyu Shinkagiru, this kind of respect is built into the style and the art. Kajiska Sensei said, the important thing is that both Muniyoshi, who is a second headmaster, and Kamiizumi, the founder, experienced pain as a loser. And they wish for peace from the bottom of their heart, wish to change the sword from a tool to kill humans to a tool to bring up humans. By these two people, Shinkage-ryu has evolved into a peacemaking sword, a sword that makes the most of people. In other words, these men who fought during the Warring States period saw the death and destruction that occurs when you are on the losing side. And that more than anything else motivated them to find a better way to exist in this world and cross this journey called life than fighting and killing. A peacemaking sword, a tool to bring up human beings and make the most of them. That is love, again, and respect. So for a teacher, these are very important traits to have. Your students are like your kids in a way, and you as the teacher are in some ways like a parent. Are you just educating them? Yes, uh, but we are also at the same time raising them with values like a sense of ethics and morality and beliefs like philosophies that the style believes in or the gods, worshiping the gods. Is your job to teach them how to cut, cut and cut? Yes. That is the technical education you give them, but it is also your job to teach them, is it right to kill? That, on the other hand, is a socialization into the beliefs and values that your style holds dear. That is the moral and spiritual education that you give them. In public education as a school teacher, we educate them in math and the ABCs of language, but we also need the parents' help because they have the important job of raising their kids with a sense of morals and norms. Um, in martial arts as teachers, we need to do both jobs, the educating and the raising. This is the unselfishness of the teacher as parent, the spirit of giving and nurturing. The seventh section is the pioneer. It says, educators must have the spirit of pioneers who thrive in uncharted territory. Kajista says his rule number four is don't be afraid. This is about being brave. Remember his analogy about climbing that mountain? And remember Yagyu Nobuharu's analogy about once you reach the top of the mountain, you will see another. So now you must go climb that one. This was his analogy of Yagyu Sekishusa's philosophy that you must improve over yourself of yesterday. It is easy to stay put, but the Yagyu way is to keep striving. Um, kind of as a footnote, I went to Brock University here in Canada, and that school's motto is Surgite, which means push on in Latin. We must strive forward. We keep climbing that mountain, and often you do so alone. As I said, the journey in Budo can be a lonely road. Being brave is also about being courageous. As a teacher, things don't happen unless we make them happen, unless we do them and create them. We are the starters, the initiators, the creators. Being a creator is being a pioneer. What is the definition of a pioneer? It is a person who begins or helps develop something new and prepares the way for others to follow. And being the pioneers, we are also at the same time setting the standard. In many ways, we have to be the model 
an example because there is no one else doing it before us. This is leadership. Being a teacher in many instances involves being a leader. A perfect example is starting up and running your own dojo, a very scary proposition. And not many can do this. You need a can-do spirit and lots of confidence and a dash of courage to venture out on your own. How did I come to this realization about, about being brave? It is actually built into the philosophy of Yagyu Shinkage-ryu. Remember Yagyu Nobuharu, the 21st headmaster, when he gave a speech at the United Nations? He went on to give more details about the philosophy of our style. Let me read this one. I'd like to touch now on some of the components of Yagyu Shinkage-ryu. An ancestor, Yagyu Sekishusai, inherited the headmastership of Shinkage-ryu from Kami Izumi Nobutsuna. In a book on secret Yagyu techniques written by Sekishusai, in Japanese it's called Motsujimi Shuden Kudensho, there is an introduction titled The Gogouken. In it, he writes that one must be brave. The real meaning of this is to be free of fear of anything. If we are controlled by others, we can't be flexible or free, which is very important in a real fight. If we are not, not brave in a real sense, we have no chance of victory. When you stand in front of an opponent, you have a situation where you push or are pushed by him. If you are pushed, you can't win. In actual life, in a normal situation, we act free, like breathing, breathing in and out. We don't have to think about situation. With this kind of mind, even when in battle, then you can watch the opponent closely and detect his movement so you can give a proper response. Braveness is built into yourself but many things can prevent it. This braveness is the first point Sekishusai discussed. In fact, Yagi, uh, Yagyu Sekishusai also said in another document, his 100 poems on the art of war, that a sword fight will eventually boil down into only two things, bravery or cowardice. Like in your Iaido or any sword style, you learn hundreds of techniques and strategies secret moves, fancy techniques, 50 or more katas, but in the end, it will come down to only two things. Are you brave or are you a coward? Being a pioneer can also involve doing something unconventional, unique, new. So you must be prepared and have the courage to face the world alone. Bravery again. Like the initial description says, thrive in uncharted territory. It's scary to be alone, doing it by yourself. But a pioneer lights the way. That takes courage, bravery. Don't be afraid. Remember, it will come down to two things, bravery or cowardice. This is the spirit of the teacher as pioneer, the spirit of lighting the way. The eighth and last section is the innovator. It says, Educators must have the courage of an innovator who continuously wonder what if and not be afraid to fail as part of the process. Fear of failure. Fear. Like they say in the famous book and movie Dune, fear is the mind killer. Like I mentioned in the previous section, to create, to innovate takes courage. You must fight your fear. To start a, a new dojo, to start a new group, to break free from an association that you have been with for many years and go in a new direction. All these things take courage. Kajista Sensei's rule number five is try new things. Let's recall what Yagyu Nobuharu said. Sekishusai said that you should surpass yourself that you were yesterday. A continuous improvement of the self is the way of Yagyu Shinkage do. In many cases, we get satisfied when we reach a certain level. We must not be satisfied to reach one level of skill or only one target. Instead, you must keep trying to improve and eventually you will find something to push yourself forward 
from within. Continuously, continuously trying to improve at the sword is related to the same effort made in Zen training. Training in the sword in Yagyu Shinkage-do means a constant improvement of the self through training in how to use the sword. So the ideal Budo spirit in our style is striving and reaching for greater heights. In our interview in 2008, we talked about the spirit of Budo. I asked Kajitsa Sensei and he replied, I asked him, in your opinion, what is the fundamental philosophy or idea of Budo? And he said, in the old styles, the techniques are of course important. But everyone knows the techniques. They have not changed. But from now on, finding something new is important. Let's take the word kobudo. What we do is classified as kobudo. It is formed of these kanji. Ko typically means old. Old usually implies dead, a dead art. But it is not old. It is not dead. It is still alive today. I don't like the term ko budo. It is not dead. It is still living. It is still adapting. It will continue to live and it will adapt to the needs, demands, and atmosphere of the times in which it finds itself. It adapts constantly. So don't be afraid of new things or trying new challenges or experiences. This is the essential spirit of budo. Hmm. In Japanese, we talk of challenge. This means about the spirit of striving and reaching for greater things, greater heights. This is still Kajisa Sensei talking. Budo has survived by adapting to each new era. To continue to survive, it has to adapt and keep adapting. All styles that stopped adapting have died out. The Edo line of Yagyu Shinkage-ryu is no more, unfortunately. This is a prime example. I really like that. Let's break down what he said. Sensei said that finding something new is important. Like my conversation with my professor, she said that we ask more questions to push our current state of knowledge further, advancing the knowledge base. Kajisa Sensei said that Kobudo is not dead, but very much alive. It keeps living because it keeps adapting to the needs, demands, and atmosphere of the times. This is your uh, new trends in Paris idea. Students hated all the changes, but these changes are in a way necessary. Sensei said that the spirit of Budo is the spirit of striving and reaching for greater things, greater heights. So this echoes Sekishusai's idea of constantly improving yourself, being better than you were yesterday. All this takes bravery to face the unknown, to challenge oneself, to start a new dojo, to go in a new direction, to try a new approach. Kajisa Sensei also said to not be afraid of new things or trying new challenges or experiences. Like the definition of this section, you need to have the courage of the innovator. This is also part of being a teacher. This is the courage of the teacher as innovator the spirit of not being afraid. So in conclusion, this graphic represents well the ideal makeup of a teacher. It also lays out the ideal traits and characteristics that teachers should aspire to. It encourages us to be an adventurer, to try new things, embrace change and keep improving yourself. A scientist, to be disciplined and dedicated in your craft and through this understanding to craft a blueprint for the students, a storyteller to tell the stories that change their life, a teacher to inspire them and to light that fire in them, a researcher to continually do research and advance knowledge, a parent to take your students under your wing, guide and raise them to be upstanding practitioners of the way, a pioneer to be the brave one to forge ahead and to light the way, and an innovator to not be afraid of change and to do new things. So just being a teacher who shows up to work, discharges his or her duty and then goes home is just punching a clock. And there are many teachers like that. 
I have served for many years as an associate teacher, which is like a mentor um, for many teacher candidates, which are like interns, mentoring and instructing young teachers who are just entering the profession. The Ministry of Education wants me to instruct them on how to make a lesson plan and deliver it. That's lesson planning and execution to make sure they understand the Ontario curriculum, to know the latest teaching techniques and technologies, to know about the education law and how not to break it. These are all technical things. They can do that through their training in teacher's college. But what they don't learn there is how to manage people, students in this particular instance. That you learn through experience, watching a master teacher do it. And when you are working with people, a lot of what I teach them is exactly a lot of what you see in this chart, how to try new things and not be afraid to fail, to inspire and lead, to guide students, to lead by example, by yourself being disciplined and dedicated, showing the students a formula on how to succeed at school and so on. Isn't it interesting that in this chart, look at the highlighted words for each modality. The adventurer, heart, the scientist, mind, the storyteller, imagination, the teacher, soul, the researcher, curiosity, the parent, unselfishness, the pioneer, spirit, the innovator, courage. These words do not pertain to technical aspects of teaching techniques. No, these words are about virtues, traits, which are emotional and spiritual parts of your character, your self, your being, your soul. Let me read one final anecdote from a book I read online called The Courage to Teach. And this will be the last quote. Okay, after three decades of trying to learn my craft, every class comes down to this. My students and I, face to face, engage in an ancient and exacting exchange called education. The techniques I have mastered do not disappear and neither do they suffice. Face to face with my students, only one resource is at my immediate command, my identity, my selfhood. Here is a secret hidden in plain sight. Good teaching cannot be reduced to technique. Good teaching comes from the identity and integrity of the teacher. In every class I teach, my ability to connect with my students and to connect them with the subject depends less on the methods I use than on the degree to which I know and trust my selfhood and am willing to make it available and vulnerable in the service of learning. My evidence for this claim comes in part from years of asking students to tell me about their good teachers. As I listen to these, those stories, it becomes impossible to claim that all good teachers use similar techniques. Some lecture nonstop and others speak very little. Some stay close to their material and others loose the imagination. Some teach with the carrot and others with the stick. But in every story I have heard, good teachers share one trait a strong sense of personal identity infuses their work. Dr. A is really there when she teaches, a student tells me. Or, Mr. B has such enthusiasm for his subject. Or, you can tell that this is really Professor C's life. One student I heard about said she could not describe her good teachers because they were so different from each other. But she could describe her bad teachers because they were all the same. Their words float somewhere in front of their faces like the speech balloons in cartoons. With one remarkable image, she said it all. Bad teachers distance themselves from the subject they are teaching and in the process from their students. Good teachers join self, subject and students in the fabric of life because they teach from an integral and undivided self. They manifest in their own lives and evoke in their students 
a capacity for connectedness. They are able to weave a complex web of connections between themselves, their students, and their subjects, so that students can learn to weave a world for themselves. So basically, you can be a fantastic martial artist, but not be able to teach it. Because teaching is the art of reaching students. So whether it is teaching martial arts or teaching language arts, it is the same. Teaching is an art form all its own. And deep down, it is about spirit, passion, and love. Wow. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. That's, um, I haven't heard of anything as detailed and as wide-ranging and with some really great stories. So I, I thought that the way that you were giving that lecture um, included so many of the aspects that we were talking about inside this image too. So thank you so much for that. Yeah. Um, I, I did write down some questions uh, sure. just to go deeper into some things and maybe they're more about just getting your opinion on some mm -hmm. of the, the stuff that you talked about. Uh, so the first one would be, um, when we talk about the adventurer and you said, how it's about getting out of, outside of your comfort zone. It's about trying new things. Um, mm -hmm. And often we just think about, okay, let me try this thing and then see how it works. Um, do you have examples of something where you tried and you failed and then you learn from it? Because I think that it's hard for people to, to try new things because they are afraid of having that failure. But having an example yeah. of something that you've done and it failed and it's like, oh, that's okay. That's just part of the process. Um, I don't have a specific example because it happens to me every day. Um, as you know, I'm a public school teacher, so I, t I teach grade one, they're six years old. And you never know, well, there's kind of a, a saying in education that, you know, um, you can design a great lesson plan, but it'll go out the window as soon as you see the first student, because it'll be something completely unexpected. And then whatever lesson you had, goes out the window and you have to adapt and you have to um, kind of uh, retool what, what you thought you were going to do. Yeah, it depends on the circumstances in that way. So it happens all the time, every day. You come in with a, with a blueprint of what you want to do um, and you have various things you want to accomplish, but of course that will depend on the students. So it is that interchange again between teacher and students that affects the whole outcome. So you will, I guess in a way, you will fail all the time. And it's just how well you um, adjust and recover um, and kind of, uh, you know, it's almost like driving a car, you know, a car will pull up and you'll veer off. So things will keep happening that way. And it's just part of, I guess that's just part of normal teaching is that you have to kind of go with the flow. Yeah. And um, so what I initially thought the lesson would be usually never turns out that way. 90% of the time. Yeah. You get maybe 20%, 30% of what you hope to accomplish, and the rest will depend on what students do and how they react to what you do. Mm -hmm. So there's that dynamic interchange all the time. Yeah. So is it failure? I guess you could call, you know, if, if, if you're the type of person who says, this is my plan and I'm going to follow this plan to the letter, that plan will not last more than five minutes. As I say, once you see the first, first or second student, that will go out the window. Yeah, because... They'll, they'll come in with their own needs and things like that that you have to adjust. Or, for example, the thing we learn in teaching is you can only go as fast as the slowest guy, right? Mm -hmm. So it will depend on, well, you may think I can teach this and this and this and this, and then it takes them longer than you thought. Oh, my God, they're not picking it up. You know, so then you have to readjust again. Oh, something went wrong. Or maybe you have to go back and redo the lesson I did yesterday because they didn't get it, right? So... There's always constant adjustments all the time. Yeah. So in a way, I wouldn't call it a failure. Um, it's just more of a process of, of finding out what works and, you know, in the moment, you know. Yeah. Of course, you, you should go in with a plan. It's always good to have a plan. So that's why they teach the beginning teachers how to lesson plan, how to structure the 40-minute the class, the idea of 40 or 50-minute class, right? Um, but of course, what actually happens is, a, is completely different. And so I, I like that general reframing of instead of saying, um, I'm doing this and seeing if it works or doesn't work, because by with that definition, if it works, it succeeds. And if it doesn't work, it fails. But instead saying, I'm going to just do this thing to see what happens. And yeah. 
there's no there's no positive or negative thing in it. It's all in seeing it's, what. It's more, yeah, it's more intentional. Oh, I would yes. like to achieve this today, right? But you know, whether they're six years old or sixteen years old, it would depend on what happens in the class. Maybe they don't pick up the material like you thought they would. Like, oh my God, they're not getting it. Or wow, this is too easy for them. I have to add more. You know, then you have to change again and add more to your lesson plan that you hadn't anticipated. Right? So there's a constant process, like you never are 100% sure. But of course, you need a plan. You should go in with a plan, yeah. But just realizing that, as we say in education, things are written in jello. Yeah. Not set in stone, but actually they're written in jello. So mm -hmm. it will change and morph and things like that. And you have to be ready to morph with it. Um, so the, the second thing. Yeah. I wouldn't think of it as failure. Uh, the second thing was uh, in the segment about the scientist, uh, you mentioned that teachers need to know how to learn as, as well. Um, and yet we also have these um, kind of, th there's this saying in um, professional sports, something like those who can't do teach. Um, so how do, you, how do you reconcile kind of that feeling that, okay, the ones that like a teacher has to be both uh, a practitioner and a teacher. And uh, whereas like even say in professional sports, you see a lot of the greatest coaches in history were not, also, were not the best practitioners themselves. So at what level do you think that like a teacher needs to be to be both a good teacher and a practitioner? Well, if you are an excellent practitioner and an excellent teacher, you are the Budo superstar. You are the cream of the crop. And that happens very rarely, okay? It does happen, but um, uh, because they're two separate art forms. You know, martial arts is one kind of art. Teaching is another type of art, yeah. So, um, and they're not the same. Now, about the sports, yes. Um, for example, some superstars cannot teach or coach their sport. They're not good at coaching. They're good at doing it, but coaching, teaching is about reaching the students, not about you doing it, but about them doing it, the students doing it. So that's completely different. When you have to get someone else to do it, then it takes some skill and some thought and some planning, right? And some, and some I guess, skill in the art of getting the students to, to do it or learn it or understand it, right? You yourself doing it is, is a completely different issue. So that's why, and about the, um, if you can't do, you coach. Well, that um, is a quaint phrase, but basically it means that, um, you know, a lot of excellent coaches were not great players. They were functional, good players, solid players, but they were not the superstar players, right? Um, however, those... Um, coaches who were like, um, you know, functional, solid players, they had to do it the hard way. They were not gifted athletically like the, like the Tiger Woods or the Wayne Gretzky's or the uh, David Beckham's of the world who are gifted with a skill, with a talent, right? So they had to do it the hard way through hard work, through analysis, through study, they had to learn their craft. So in a way they are the perfect teachers to teach regular students who don't are not blessed with talent like the superstars right so the superstars you should actually think of them as a separate category they're not in a normal they're not normal <laughs> they're not a normal person they're abnormal in a way so they you know you know the super like in education we say you know there's there's this kind of uh, norm bell curve norm distribute normal distribution right most of your people are in the center and then you have some on the fringes on the outside and they're on one end are the gifted, whether it's physically gifted or intellectually gifted. Right? And then most of the people are in the middle. Right. So that's a normal distribution in the population. So those people are abnormal in, the, in, in, on that end. Mm. So most of the people are in, clumped in the middle. So your good coaches, they're probably on the higher end. You're, your B plus, right? They're on your higher end, but they had to learn the hard way. They weren't gifted physically or um, in 
that way. So they had to learn the hard way how to succeed at their sport. And that probably gave them a lot of good life lessons on how to teach it to somebody else who is in the same boat as them, right? Yeah. The gifted ones, it's just a gift. They don't even think about it. They just go perform and do whatever. And they don't really, they didn't have to struggle. Well, they probably had to struggle in their own way, but they didn't have to struggle like the regular people, right? So in that way, that's why I wouldn't put down coaches in that way. I think they had to do it the hard way, but through hard work, persistence, study, dedication, they learned the, the craft of how to succeed in that art, right? So, so in relating it to this statement of teachers need to know how to learn, uh, yeah. that's kind of saying like those top tier superstar talents didn't really have to need to learn because they just naturally picked it up. Yeah. So since they're born with it, they, um, that's what they need, makes them not so good as teacher. Yeah. They needed some training to hone those arts. They had the, the natural talent in there, but they need a good coach also. They need a different kind of coach to make it excellent. Right. Of course, they, they need their own kind of polishing in their way. Mm -hmm. But yeah, what you said, the, the normal coach has to be a good learner because they have to, as I said, they had to learn the hard way how to succeed in their art. What do I need to succeed in soccer? Well, I need to be able to do this, 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 this. And they break it down and they analyze and then they, they go to clinics and they go to camps and they study and they, you know, it's a long, hard road. Yeah. But they did it. There's a, they are the success story. So mm -hmm. they take success story and teach it to others. Yeah, that's a good point too, because if I think about some of the recent good coaches, like if you think about uh, Phil Jackson for the for basketball, professional basketball, you think of Kurt Browning for figure skating, mm -hmm. neither of them were the best in the world. So they weren't in like the 0.1%, but they're still right. in the 1%. Like they were still in that top range, even though Phil Jackson didn't have many accolades, he still made it to the NBA which in itself already meant that he was better than 99% of the rest of the world. <laughs> and Kurt Browning got like a couple of bronze medals, I think. Yeah. Um, but Kurt Browning is an excellent coach, right? He's coaching a lot of high level yes. uh, skaters, right? So Yeah, so um, that, that's the example of someone that he never made it to the pinnacle and yet he can coach like, uh, it was that um, Korean skater that sh she won like multiple... Uh, gold medals see he figured out the formula the success formula he's got it he figured it out that's why they all flock to him to get trained because they know he's got the formula he figured it out he he got a blue he's got a blueprint and he's churning out champions so that means his his formula his blueprint works yeah so he's probably writing books and doing videos and becoming rich just through that yeah so in some ways he's more successful than <laughs> <laughs> the top level guy. Yeah. So, um, so the, the next yeah. so, uh, question about, yeah, the, you have to be able to learn. And usually good teachers are good learners. They know how to analyze, they know how to dissect, they know how to break it down, re deconstruct it, reconstruct it for students. Like I said, with Kurt Brown, that's an excellent example. He learned this is how you succeed in the sport. These, this is how you succeed to become the top champions, right? He's got a, a, a blueprint from probably five years old all the way to 20, right, of the steps they need to do. Yeah. Probably based on his own experience and the experience of being in that world and seeing the other success stories of how these people rose. And he's figured out a formula. So he's a good learner in that way. Because if he wasn't a good learner, he, wouldn't, he would just be like, ah, I don't understand how it works, right? So in that way... You have to be an excellent learner as well. They have skills in other ways, in other departments. So that's what I, oh, I can't hear you. But that's what I said about, um, you have to be, uh, I guess, have a love of constructing that learning journey for the students. That's the art of teaching. That's part mm -hmm. of it. And that kind of reminds me of uh, the Margaret Thompson Award thing that you had, you read about, about helping many people um, and one of the things that she said was, or it was written about her, was that she was able to help people develop their self-esteem. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if you can give any examples of either for yourself or for any of your students, like what is that change that you actually see when, you, when someone comes in with low self-esteem and leaves or gradually over time builds that up? Like what, what does that actually look like in terms of increasing confidence in themselves? Um, well... 
as you know, every student is different and unique and, and individual. You can't put them in a cookie cutter in that way. Um, yeah, that's, that's a difficult one to pick out. Like usually you'll see the confidence when they first join, they don't really know anything. They don't know what to do. And you look at them five years later and they are just a polished, or they should be if you're a good teacher, they are very polished in what they do. Um, another one can be, they come in with very low self-esteem, don't have many friends. And a couple of years later, they're in the social dojo. You know, they're part of that network of people in the dojo and they go out and they socialize and stuff like that. So that's another self-esteem or confidence thing that they may have been lacking before, like socialization skill. Um, other ones, um, especially some of my group leaders were never dojo leaders be to begin with. They were just students, right? But um, like yourself, being a dojo leader, you know, take some experience, take some trial and error, but you must have some, some confidence and um, not be afraid of failing and, and maybe not even think of failing, just, you know, let me try this out and see what happens. And you kind of go with the flow and when things come up, you just deal with them. So, and I've seen that in my dojo leaders, my group leaders, um, how they've grown over four or five years. They're now leading seminars. They're, on, they're leading their own online classes, right? Um, in this pandemic. And they have their own dojos and they manage their own students. And of course we talk and, you know, how to manage the students, you know, well, what to do in this situation, because you have all different types of situations, right? So, but it's interesting, you can see the growth in them, um, that they're not thinking like a student anymore, and they're now thinking like a leader, or they're thinking like uh, a teacher, an instructor, you know? The whole thing about, oh, I'm a teacher or I'm a master, well, we don't need to think about that. An easy way to think, of, like I am not a, I guess I am technically speaking, a study group leader. My job is to lead the group in their study. So this whole ponderous thing of, oh, you are a master or you are a master teacher. Okay, we don't need to deal with any of those kind of titles and things like that. It's just way too presumptuous. So you are just the leader of the group and your job, I am tasked anyways, to get them to practice. That is my job, is to get them to practice. So whatever Kajista Sensei sends us, we practice. Simple, easy, no pressure, right? You, the only pressure is getting everybody on the same page and getting them to practice. Perfect, let's do that. Um, and so I impart that same, it's like a pyramid, I impart that same philosophy onto my dojo, my study group leaders, my dojo leaders, say, you, you, guys, you guys do the same thing. This is what Kajisa Sensei gave us. That's our homework. You guys got to get your group to do it. And so they feel much more comfortable doing that. Yeah, yeah I, I really like the examples you gave because it wasn't even... It had nothing to do with being more confident in their fighting skills or being able to face conflict. It was more about what more can they do um, besides just being a follower or a, 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 a participant that doesn't do anything extra. Like now, now they feel like, okay, I can put myself out there and, and do some kind of leading or teaching. Yeah, getting invested, I guess, in the enterprise or the business, they call it. Okay, getting invested, feeling empowered a little bit more. And sometimes um, when they just focus on the job, they're, they're not so um, weighted down with this responsibility of, oh, I'm a teacher. Oh, my God, I have, uh, I got to do this. And I get, okay, don't worry about that. All you need to worry about is you got to get your students to practice. So get them together. It's just almost like a seminar leader, right? Just get them together and get them to practice. You're supposed to practice this. So let's practice this. Simple. You don't need to put on any airs. You don't need to have any fancy uh, aphorisms or uh, super knowledge about anything, just get them to practice that, that's it. So that takes a lot of pressure off them and they get used to that and more comfortable. And after a while, because they're leading and managing, basically they're managing the group um, and they get more comfortable with that. Um, and that's basically part of being a leader is getting everybody motivated to attend practice and to actually do the practice and keeping them unified and together and cohesive, right? that they don't split apart and then managing all the personalities because that naturally will happen when you're a seminar leader, you just have 20 different personalities in the classroom. You've got to manage them all. Right. And you know, this guy's having a bad day and that guy doesn't want to work today. And you know, so that over time, over years, you kind of get used to it and you just naturally drift in, into the, 
into the role. Mm. Because it's very, I guess, um, there's a lot of pressure when you first feel, oh my God, I, I, have, to, I have to be a leader. Well, it's not that difficult. <laughs> I guess you can ease your way into it, right? Just naturally. Uh, and the last question I had was related to this point that you had mentioned a couple times uh, in this lecture was the new fashions from Paris comment. And we see that a lot. Um, how much do you think that the changes that they, that the head organization passes down are, are changes on, on purpose for the sake of changing and maybe exposing like the rest of the students to, to be able to adapt to it? And how much of it has is like necessary in, in some ways, because if you think about it, it, it is all based in fighting arts and we don't fight anymore. So why else are they instituting this? So that, now, um, that's an interesting perspective. Now let's think in terms of perspective. So the perspective that you just gave me, um, so repeat what you just said, like basically that's a student perspective looking up right? So can you repeat what you just said? Like, how do the students feel? Uh, well, I was saying that, is it, are they changing it because they want to give the students a, a something to change and something to force them to adapt to so that they can experience it and learn from it? Okay. So yeah, that's, that's the bottom looking up, right? The students, are they, like you said, are they doing this and this and this and this? So they up here, right? Let's change the perspective. So the person at the top of the Denme, the association or the group or committee at the top of the association, how do they feel? That's a, that's a very interesting point. Like, and in my last podcast, I brought up, remember I brought up that conversation about Kajitsa Sensei when he came in 2015 and said, I have this weight of responsibility to pass the art on intact and whatever, in the right spirit. And so let's think about that committee. How do they feel as the leaders of a worldwide organization for let's say EIDO? Should we keep it the same and unchanged for decades? But don't forget that they also, remember our little conversation here, that little graphic, they are also researchers in their way. So if you think about them, they're probably researching now that they have inherited the soke ship or whatever you call it at, in the Ido, it is now their responsibility to look at the art through their eyes, not through their predecessor's eyes, through their eyes now. Like, did my predecessor do the right thing? You know, and they're probably looking through the, the scrolls or whatever they look through, the den show, and you know, probably you know, if you've ever seen those den show, they're like there's got some descriptions and they're very kind of vague, yeah. Um, but they're kind of general principles, I think. And you know, every teacher will have their own interpretation of what that means. So no two people will agree, and you know they'll have their own certain flavor depending on their background, their experiences, and things like that. And maybe I'm just supposing, but maybe they feel, well, you know what? I think it, it's probably like this. And so isn't that perspective more of between that in teacher and the the art and the past, rather than the teacher and what the students like? Isn't this just making a different interpretation of what's written? not really perceiving on yeah. like well, what the students it, need? Now, there's probably a lot of politics and there's probably a lot of things going on that we don't know about. You know, I'm just supposing that maybe they didn't agree with the previous teacher or maybe their own teacher had a different perspective and they believe that one's right. Well, I don't know. It could be any one of, you know, it's case by case, right? So we have no idea what they're thinking up there, but I would probably think that it might be based on their version of some kind of research into the art or the principles of the art or something. They believe it should be this way or they believe this or that and they institute a change, right? Um, now the worst case scenario, I don't know if it's worst case is that you keep it the same for all time. 
Well, is that even possible? I don't know. That's a good question. Do you want to keep it the same for all time? Then it might become very stale. There's no new learning at all. So there's nothing, especially if you think your fourth and fifth dance, like what are they going to do now? There's nothing new to learn. There's nothing new to aspire to. I guess, is that part of the higher level is that you do your own research into the art and you make your own discovery, right? So, well, any change from the top, any of these new fashions or new interpretations, basically they're interpretations and expressions, right? And everybody's different, every practitioner is different. What worked for the previous guy doesn't work for me because I'm bigger than him or I'm taller than him or I'm faster or whatever, right? So everybody's body type is different that affects technique. Mindset is different as well. Philosophy, maybe they don't believe in that. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm, I'm just uh, hypothesizing, but um, it could be any number of factors. Um, and I know students, you know, oh my God, it just, it was like this and now it's changed. And oh my God, well, I, I have to change, you know? And you have to question like, why don't they want to change? Yeah. Why is it so bad to change? Oh, because I have to learn a whole new, I, I have to give up what I knew already. And so what? You're back to being a beginner again? So there we get into an ego thing that I don't want to be a beginner again. I, I, I know this art. This is, this is the way it is. I, I don't want to change. Well, basically, that's the bottom line. I don't want to change. I'm happy where I am. So in that way, then you become stuck. Remember this whole thing about getting stuck and fossilized after a while that you're not capable of changing. That's, I don't know, I would think that's a worst case scenario. You know, you want practitioners who can change, who can adapt, and, you know, a living art. Remember what Kajisa Sensei said about Budo changes, adapts to every new era and every new situation It adapts and keeps adapting. That's why it's a living art, not a dead art. So I guess that's the danger maybe of not changing is become a dead art. You might as well just put it in a museum. That's it. It will never change from now on. It's under glass. You just study it and do it like this. Then there's no new discoveries. There's nothing new or nothing fascinating to discover. You're not allowed to discover anything by yourself because it's immutable and under glass. It can never change. Well, that's no fun for the upcoming fourth and fifth dance who are looking forward. Hey, maybe I can change things. Maybe I can discover something about the art that no one else has discovered. So you kind of cut that off, right? So in that way, it becomes a dead art. Um, and like he said, styles that did not change died out. So maybe that's a danger too, yeah. So a living art, a breathing art adapts. So maybe you want that as a, since it is a fighting art, Iaido is a fighting art. You know, any martial art is a fighting art. It has to adapt all the time. Every opponent is different. You have to adapt. You cannot be immutable. I will not change. It must be this way. Well, you can try it and you probably get clocked. <laughs> right? So you have to adapt to what the opponent throws at you. So that adaptive mindset, I would think, is more valuable than whether I'm cutting 33 degrees or 34 degrees or, you know, does it really matter? I don't know. So that's, that's actually a very interesting theory because if you think about um, the idol lineages on a macro scale, so not just like in this current day, who's the who's the highest rank? Who's the one that's kind of giving their interpretation? The fact that that highest person changes all the time and they have a different interpretation is our is our exposure to different types of opponents in some ways because the the written part of the kata doesn't change. The scenario very rarely changes, but the mm. interpretation can based on the whoever's at the head. And in some ways, you can treat that as your changing opponent. Like sometimes the head might be a taller guy. Some might, the head might be someone that's stronger. So in, in adapting it to their interpretation, you're also learning how to face a different opponent in some ways. Yeah. And the thing, well, yeah. And if you've been in martial arts long enough, you'll see a lot of changes all the time. And you either adapt or you leave. It's very simple, you know, and you might not agree with it. And when, if you want to stay, you have to adapt. And if you don't, then you leave. That's usually, you see a lot of, especially when headmasters change, you see a lot of overturn, turning over of the staff, basically. It's like the same in any company, right? <laughs> right? Uh, in a school, when the principal leaves, whoever was the principal's uh, uh, favorite teachers or whatever, now that you come and have a new principal, 
everything changes. Yeah. And then the people who don't like it leave. The people who like it will stay. So, um, and that happens all the time in life. Um, so is it necessarily a bad thing that things change? Theoretically, I, I would say no. You know, life is changing every minute that we speak and you have to kind of adapt micro adaptations all the time. Now, in terms of technique, yeah, this guy will think that and the other guy will think a different thing. And is it that bad? I guess for your 20, 30 year old practitioners, you know, I guess they can say, you know what? In 2000, it was this. And in 2010, it was this. And in 2015, it was this. And in 2020, it's this. And is it such a bad thing, you know, that you know these many different ways? I actually, you might want to look at them as henka, they call it, variations, or right? In a lot of the koryu, they have, okay, here's what the kata says, you do this. But actually, there are a couple different meanings for this. It could be this, 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 or this. It could be a cut, it could be a slice, it could be a block. Like in Katori Shintoryu, a lot of the omote tachi, the basic katas, the guy cuts and you block. Well, at higher levels, they say, there is no blocking. It's not a block. It's actually a cut to the neck. Okay. But for beginners, okay, block. We have to learn how to block. So fine, let's do that. So some people call it variations, henka, or kind of... Mm. More so that's advantage. another, yeah, actually, I, I really like that perspective as well, in that people are always thinking it's just changing from one to next to next to next as a linear process, when in fact, it's more like you have a wide variety of ways of doing this. It's less of a change and more of a choice. So during this person's head thing, we already know that there's all these ways, but I'm going to choose this one as the standard for this period of time. And the next person is going to choose a different for the standard. But if you're practicing these arts for to, to actually be able to use it, you should right. be practicing all these alternate versions anyways, because like it, it, that's the only way it'll be realistic. Well, and it also adds richness to your technique. Like think of, think of the worst case scenario. I, it is only this way and this way only, and I can only do it this way. Well, that's sad, actually. From a fighting perspective, you can't do it any other way. <laughs> then you're really limited as a practitioner. You can only do it one way. Wow. You're not going to live very long if you do it that way. Right? So like I said, in your yaido, there's, there's, there's a kata where they cut the guys in the bushes, right? Three times? Yep. Chick, chick, yep. chick. Well, one master might say, well, you, the guy's crouching in the bushes, you cut his head. And the other guy said, no, 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 you cut his hand. No, 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 no you cut his leg. Does it matter? They're all variations. Kata is still the same. Target is different. Okay, fine. Does it really matter that much? But it adds richness to your technique. Well, I can cut the head. I can cut the arm. I can cut the leg. Right? So I tend to think upon it as that. Yeah. So that's the beginner mindset. Oh, show, show me more. Show me more. I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. Right? Great. Then you're very skilled. You're multi-adaptable. Mm -hmm. yeah. Rather than a one-trick pony, I can only do this. No, 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 the, the, the scroll says this. We can only do it this way. Then it's a dead art. There's, there's no other way. Okay, that's it. Discussion over. So there's, in that way, it's a transmission only. There's no interchange. There's no dialogue. There's no adaptation. There's no, we say in Katholic Shinto, there's no communication between them. Right? So... Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. <laughs> yeah, no, this is this is great. It's ex we're kind of modeling that behavior here too in, in a kind of student teacher or multiple people on the same mountain kind of looking at it in different perspectives. And I think that, that that's kind of what we want to, or what you wanted to, to share in terms of right. um, this lecture. So thank you. Oh, that actually brings up a good point about teaching is that you, okay, Let's say you have an A student, a B student, a C student, okay? So you're teaching, I don't know, four times four multiplication. To the A student, they'll get it without much explanation. To the B student, you gotta, okay, I, I can't do it the same as the A student. I gotta change my method a little bit for the B student. And for the C student who's struggling, oh, okay, I really gotta make it sim simplify it for them and go step by step by step. So you, even in this little scenario, you have to change depending on the student. 
you have to be adaptable as a teacher, multi-adaptable, try different approaches. In many ways up the mountain, they say, right? Yeah. Oh no, it must be one way only. Well, if there's one way only, that's it. It's over, right? So, um, and that's the dynamism, the dynamic quality of teaching is that it's constantly changing and you have to, as a teacher, I guess the expression is you have to think on your feet and you do. Mm -hmm. Well, same in fighting, you have to think on your feet, right? Yeah. That's to. another very interesting obs like observation of that mountain analogy is that if there's only one way, then there's only a certain, num a certain type of student that will be able to follow you along that path. The A student may be able to, but the B and C wouldn't be able to. So and they're all behind. <laughs> so in that sense, like a sign of a good teacher too could be the amount of different students that they have. So a good teacher would have students that are in the A level or B level or C level, but think of it in different ways, but still are able to learn from you. Whereas the ones with just a small group of same type of students, you can see that they're not as adapting to their style. Yeah. Yeah. And well, in public education, there's an expression that we're like the Marines, we never leave a man behind. So <laughs> you got to service all students, A, B, C, D, and you have to all get them up the mountain somehow. Right. So, um, so that's a, that's a good analogy and you have to find some way to do it. So in that way, you have to be very flexible, flexible, adaptable, fluid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, absolutely. Cause even just thinking about my daughter being in private school, there's a certain type of, it's a much more narrow spectrum of, of kids that go there compared to like public school. Like it's a wider variety. So it's a lot harder. <laughs> my, like H Hannah, my wife is a, a public school teacher. So she definitely sees the gamut and she's a special ed teacher. So even even more so on, on the edges. Um, your, so your wife? Can, mm -hmm. Yeah. My, my wife's a special education teacher in public oh, okay. school system. Yeah. Oh, in TDSB. Yep. So she's she had to teach from like grade one to grade eight, yeah. special ed, learning disability. Uh, developmentally yep. delayed, that kind of thing. Autism, you, Down you have syndrome. to be creative. Yeah. Yeah, you got to be very creative. But in normal teaching, it's the same. You have to be very creative as well. You know, so um, the A students are not the D students. They're all completely different and you have to treat each one differently. And you also have to, I guess this is what they call differentiated learning, right? Every student is different. You have to find unique ways to teach every student. So, because what works for one, it's not a cookie cutter approach. What works for one will not work for another. Yeah. Okay. Because so, yeah. yeah. Thanks, a, thanks a lot for, again, a very interesting, fascinating, illuminating uh, conversation. I'm hoping we can continue doing this on a regular basis for, for more. Um, in the meantime, just like all the other ones, like you'll get to see this final version before I, I publish yeah. it. It'll probably be in a little while because I have a little bit of a backlog, but. No uh, problem. This, this material is evergreen, so it wouldn't matter when we publish it, it'll still be useful for people. So thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, and there's a lot of stuff to discuss in education, like your wife can probably tell you. Like, and it applies to Budo as well, you know, because it's, again, it's a separate ball game, uh, teaching and Budo. But in some ways they're similar, in some ways they're different. Anyways. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, we'll see you again soon. Okay, thanks, Patrick. Bye. Cheers. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode because we have a lot more exciting conversations to share as we explore the world of the traditional Japanese martial arts. The Inside Look podcast is brought to you by our amazing patrons over at Patreon. If you are enjoying this work, please consider supporting me at patreon.com forward slash Tokushikai Canada. To contribute to this effort, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram at tokushikai.canada or subscribe to our newsletter at subscribe at tokushikai.ca. Until next time, thanks for listening.